Testing one, two, one, two test, test one, two, two. caption test, test, caption test. test.
There will be no computer or slides. Test one, test two. Testing one, two. Mic one. Volume set, subscribe. Sure. Testing one, two, three, four.
record up there. Test one, test two. I will go to my box. Thank you, thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today. My name is Charles Cannon. I'm the Senior Assistant Dean and CAO at the School of Law. Dean Chemerinsky is, by the National Jurist Magazine, the leading legal educator in the United States and has been a number of times. He is the Jesse Choper Distinguished Professor of Law and Dean of Berkeley Law. Prior to his arrival last summer, he was the founding dean of the University of California Irvine School of Law. Prior to that, he was a law professor at USC, Duke, UCLA, and DePaul. Dean Chemerinsky is the author of 10 authoritative books, more than 200 law articles. He's one of the most cited law professors in the country. He continues to argue appellate cases, including in the US Supreme Court. And above all, he is an incomparably warm and civil human being, which we all need right now. So I give you Dean Erwin Chemerinsky. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and the warm welcome. It's truly an honor and a pleasure to be here. One of the things that I've learned since coming to Berkeley last year is that there's terrific staff in literally every school and department. And it's so an honor to me, it's such an honor to me to be able to get to speak as part of this Staff Appreciation Week. And I was asked to talk about, key to my field, the United States Supreme Court. And it's so important for all of us because what the Supreme Court decides affects everyone, often the most intimate, the most important aspects of their lives. And this is a very pivotal time when it comes to the United States Supreme Court. I thought what I would do is make a few observations about where the court is now and where it's likely to go in the foreseeable future, and then review for you what I regard as the most important decisions from last term, which was truly monumental with regard to the United States Supreme Court. My first observation is that last term of the court was the beginning of a new era, an era without a swing justice. Last year, the Supreme Court decided 59 cases after briefing an oral argument with signed opinions. That's the fewest number of cases decided in a year by the Supreme Court since 1864. I think the most significant statistic about last term is that there were 19 5-4 decisions. In 14 of them, Justice Anthony Kennedy joined with, 
Chief Justice John Roberts, Justice Clarence Thomas, Justice Samuel Alito, and Justice Neil Gorsuch to create the majority. In none of the five four cases did Justice Kennedy join with Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sonner, and Kagan to create the majority. To put this in some historical context, Anthony Kennedy came onto the Supreme Court in February 1988. He served for a bit more than three decades. Over those 30 years, when the court was split five to four, Kennedy would be with the conservatives 75% of the time and with the liberals 25% of the time. The year before last, when the justices were split, 5-4 or 5-3, Kennedy was with the liberals 57% of the time and the conservatives 43% of the time. Last year, when the justices were split 5-4, to four, Kennedy was with the conservatives 100% of the time. That explains why in almost every major case, the conservative position prevailed. Errors on the United States Supreme Court last a long time. One era was from the 1890s to 1936. During this period, there was a very conservative Supreme Court. It declared unconstitutional over 200 federal, state, and local laws, especially those protecting workers and consumers. Another error from the Supreme Court was from 1937 to 1969. During this time, there's always a majority of justices appointed by Democratic presidents. The court became increasingly more liberal, especially into the 1960s, under the direction of Chief Justice Earl Warren. The next era on the court began in 1969, when Richard Nixon had two nominees confirmed for the court. He then had two more nominees confirmed in 1971. From 1969 until February 13th, 2016, the day Justice Antonin Scalia died, there were always at least five, and sometimes as many as eight justices who were appointed by Republican presidents. But all during this time, there was always a swing justice, a Lewis Powell, a Sandra Day O'Connor, an Anthony Kennedy, who would join with the liberal justices to create a majority, particularly in some of those high profile, controversial areas, like abortion rights, affirmative action, gay and lesbian rights. What was striking about last year in the Supreme Court is there was no swing justice. We talked about Anthony Kennedy as the swing justice, but last year in the court, he just didn't swing. He stayed anchored with the conservative justices. The effect of replacing Anthony Kennedy with somebody who's even more conservative, Brett Kavanaugh, means that there's not likely to be a swing justice for the foreseeable future. This era, too, is likely to last a long time. Think of the ages of the conservative justices. Clarence Thomas is 70 years old. Samuel Alito is 68. John Roberts is 63. Brett Kavanaugh is 53. Neil Gorsuch is 51. It's easy to imagine these five justices being together another decade or two. Well, this brings me to my second observation. What is the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh likely to mean for the future constitutional law. As I already alluded to, when the court was ideologically split five to four, Justice Kennedy was the conservatives three quarters of the time, and with the liberals one quarter of the time. I expect in all of the areas where Kennedy was with the conservatives, Kavanaugh will be as well. I'll give you an example, campaign finance reform. It was Anthony Kennedy who wrote the opinion for the court, joined by the four most conservative justices, saying that corporations have the right to spend unlimited amounts of money in election campaigns to get us elected or defeated, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. Justice Kennedy was always with the conservative justices when it comes to the Second Amendment and gun rights. I expect Brett Kavanaugh will vote the same way in these areas. But I can identify a number of areas where Justice Kennedy has historically been with the liberal justices. I don't think that Brett Kavanaugh will be, and these are the places where we're going to see a significant change in the law. One of these areas is abortion rights. In 1992, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, Justice Kennedy was part of a five-person majority, it was five to four, to reaffirm Roe versus Wade. 
two years ago, in 2016, in Whole Women's Health versus Hellerstedt, Justice Kennedy was part of a five-person majority to strike down a Texas law that would have closed most facilities in that state where abortions were performed. Based on his opinions, as a judge on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit, I believe that Brett Kavanaugh will not vote the same way. He will be a consistent vote against abortion rights. I think there are now five justices on the court who either effectively or explicitly overrule Roe versus Wade. Since 2010, 33 states have adopted over 400 new laws imposing restrictions on abortion. If the Supreme Court upholds these laws, it will close most of the facilities in these states where abortions are performed. But I also believe there's quite likely five justices who will explicitly overrule Roe and leave the issue of abortion entirely to states to regulate as they see fit. Another area where the shift from Kennedy to Kavanaugh is going to make a difference is with regard to affirmative action. Two years ago, in 2016, in Fisher versus University of Texas, Justice Kennedy wrote the opinion for the court upholding the University of Texas Austin Affirmative Action Program. Justice Kennedy spoke of how colleges and universities have a compelling interest in having a diverse student body. He talked about how there should be deference to colleges and universities in their admissions decisions as to how to achieve diversity. I do not believe Brett Kavanaugh will vote the same way. I think there are now five justices on the court who will hold that all forms of affirmative action in education, in contracting, in employment violate the Constitution and are impermissible. Third area concerns gay and lesbian rights. Did you know that the majority opinion in every Supreme Court decision in history expanding rights for gays and lesbians was written by Anthony Kennedy? Romer versus Evans in 1996, Lawrence versus Texas in 2003, and then the two marriage equality cases, United States versus Windsor in 2013, and Oberfeld versus Hodges in 2015. I have heard some liberals say that they're sanguine about marriage equality. They don't think that there'll be five votes to overrule the Supreme Court decisions, striking down state laws prohibiting same-sex marriage. I'm not so optimistic. In Oberfeld versus Hodges in 2015, which said state laws prohibiting same-sex marriage are unconstitutional, Chief Justice Roberts, along with Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, each wrote vehement dissents. A year ago, in 2017, Justice Gorsuch wrote a dissent, joined by Justice Thomas and Alito, that clearly indicated that he would overrule Oberfell and allow states to prohibit marriage equality. We may now have five votes to reconsider that. But even if the court doesn't reconsider marriage equality for gays and lesbians, so many other issues are going to come to the court with regard to sexual orientation in the law. I think it's likely that this year the court will take a case on whether employment discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation is a form of sex discrimination that violates federal employment discrimination law. There's going to be so many cases coming to the court about whether business owners can discriminate against same-sex couples on account of the religious beliefs of the business owners. There's going to be cases involving transgender rights. I'll give you one more example where the shift from Justice Kennedy to Justice Kavanaugh's likely to make a big difference. And that's with regard to punishment in criminal cases. To be sure, Anthony Kennedy was never willing to join with the liberal justices to find that the death penalty is inherently cruel and unusual punishment. But Justice Kennedy often joined with the liberal justices to limit when a death sentence could be imposed or limit the punishments that could be imposed in a criminal case. As an example, in 2005, in Roper versus Simmons, Justice Kennedy wrote for the court, it was five to four, that it's cruel and unusual punishment to impose a death sentence for a crime committed by a juvenile. In 2008, in Kennedy versus Louisiana, Justice Kennedy wrote for the court, it was again five to four, that it's cruel and unusual punishment to impose a death sentence for any crime other than murder. In 2010, Justice Kennedy wrote for the court, again five to four, that it's cruel and usual punishment to impose a sentence of life without possibility of parole 
for a non-homicide crime committed by a juvenile. In 2012, in Miller versus Alabama, Justice Kennedy was part of a five-person majority, it was five to four, that it's cruel and unusual punishment to have a mandatory sentence of life without parole for a homicide committed by a juvenile. I think without Justice Kennedy present, there will not be five votes to impose such limits on punishment in criminal cases. Third and final general observation. What about the longer term future of the Supreme Court? Did you know that since 1960, 78 years old is the average age at which Supreme Court justices left the bench? When the justices came back for this new term on the court, which began three weeks ago today on the first Monday in October, there were two justices older than 78. Ruth Bader Ginsburg had turned 85 on March 15th of this year. Stephen Breyer turned 80 on August 15th. Now, I have no doubt that Justices Ginsburg and Breyer will remain on the court into the end of the Trump presidency if their health allows them to do so. I've heard many people remark that Justice Ginsburg appears very frail on the bench. I first met her in 1986 when she was a judge on the DC Circuit. She looked really frail then, too. <laughs> and I've got to believe that Justice Ginsburg and Breyer have left instructions with their law clerks that if anything happens to them, just keep them on the bench and keep voting. <laughs> but especially if President Trump is reelected in 2020, it seems likely that he'll have other seats to fill on the United States Supreme Court. That would be solidifying a staunch conservative majority for years to come. So I guess the bottom line, as you think about the Supreme Court now and the foreseeable future, is that if you are politically conservative, this is a time to be jubilant. Conservatives who worked for decades to create a majority on the Supreme Court, and now they have it. If you're politically liberal, maybe the most encouraging thing I can say to you is that perhaps the Supreme Court will continue to decide fewer and fewer cases each year. <laughs> I thought what I would do is review for you what I regard as the most important cases from last term. A Supreme Court term begins, as I said, on the first Monday in October. It goes to the end of June. And so this is officially called October term 2018. Last year, it was officially called October term 2017. Let me tell you about some of the most important cases from what's referred to as OT17. And I've listed four areas for you. And I've tried to pick cases that really matter in terms of our lives in terms of our society. And I've prepared a handout for you that lists these cases. The first area that I listed concerns criminal law and criminal procedure, specifically the Fourth Amendment. And the case is Carpenter versus the United States. Timothy Carpenter was a suspect in a series of armed robberies. Perhaps ironically, given what the case is about, they were largely armed robberies of radio shacks. I'm teaching criminal procedure this semester, so I covered this case. I realized in doing so that I needed to explain to my students what a radio shack used to be. <laughs> On the other hand, one of the most important Supreme Court cases about the Fourth Amendment that concerns searches and seizures involved the police listening to a conversation in a phone booth. I realized I also need to explain what a phone booth used to be. <laughs> the police went to Timothy Carpenter's cell phone companies and they got his stored cellular location information for a period of 127 days. Anytime any of us uses our cell phone, it automatically connects with a cell tower. It doesn't matter if we're emailing or texting or searching the web, it connects with a cell tower. As we move, our phone automatically shifts from one cell tower to another. In fact, even if we're not using our phone, it's repeatedly automatically connecting to cell towers so long as it is on. Thus, the police can determine somebody's location with a fair degree of precision by getting the cellular location information. You can track somebody's movements through the cellular location information. When Carpenter was prosecuted for this series of armed robberies, the stored cellular location information was the key evidence against him because they could show he was near the radio shacks at the time the robberies occurred. 
to the cellular location information. His lawyer said that for the police to obtain this information without a warrant violates the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment, of course, is the provision that the police can engage in a search or an arrest only if they have a warrant that's based on probable cause. There was no warrant here. Carpenter lost his suppression motion in federal district court. He was convicted. He was sentenced to 119 years in prison. The Federal Court of Appeals, the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, affirmed, and it came to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, reversed and ruled in favor of Carpenter. Chief Justice Roberts wrote the opinion for the court, joined by Justices Ginsburg, Breyer, Sonner, and Kagan. Each of the dissenting justices, Kennedy, Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch, wrote a separate dissent. This is the only major case that I can identify from last term where the liberal position prevailed, and it's because of the relatively unusual occurrence of John Roberts joining with the liberal justices. The Supreme Court has said for a half century that in determining what's a search, the focus on somebody's reasonable expectation of privacy. The court said for the police to obtain 127 days of information about where Carpenter was located infringed his reasonable expectation of privacy. Chief Justice Roberts said, you can learn a lot about a person by accessing such information. You can see what doctors a person's going to visit, what people a person's going to see, where a person's going to worship. And so the Supreme Court said, if police want to obtain extensive stored cellular location information, they need to get a warrant, or at least one of the exceptions to the warrant requirement must be met. But the court left open many questions. What if police don't want 127 days of information? What if they just want to get at this moment in time where a person is located? Is that going to require a warrant based on probable cause? Or what if it's for seven days rather than 127 days? The Supreme Court said it wasn't going to answer the question. Nonetheless, I think it's a really important case in applying the Fourth Amendment to modern technology. A few years ago, there was a Supreme Court case about this case called Riley versus California. The issue is, if the police arrest somebody, can the police look at the contents of a person's cell phone as part of a search incident arrest? If police arrest somebody, they're allowed to look in their pockets, their purses, their backpacks as part of a search incident arrest. What about looking at the contents of a cell phone? And the Supreme Court, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, said that we all have important privacy interests and what's on our cell phone. Through somebody's cell phone, it's possible to connect to the cloud and learn even more. People sometimes have their medical records, their financial records on their cell phone or accessible through the cell phone to the cloud. And the court said police can't look at the contents of a cell phone unless they've got a warrant based on probable cause or it's an emergency situation. I put these cases together because I think it shows at least there's a majority on the court that's sensitive to the threats to privacy from the new and emerging technology. The second area of cases that I listed concerns the First Amendment and freedom of speech. And there are three quite important speech cases from last term. The one that got the most media attention was Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission. The case involves a gay couple in Colorado that went to Massachusetts to get married. This was at a time when Massachusetts allowed same-sex marriage, but Colorado didn't yet. <coughs> After getting married in Massachusetts, they decided to come back home and have a party celebrating their wedding with family and friends. They went to a local bakery, the Masterpiece Cake Shop. They asked the proprietor, Jack Phillips, to design and bake a cake for them. Phillips refused. He said, same-sex marriage violated his religious beliefs. He said he would be complicit in something against his religion were he to design and bake the cake. Colorado, like California, like many states, has a public accommodations law that says that business establishments cannot discriminate based on race, sex, religion, or sexual orientation. The couple filed a complaint with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission saying that Masterpiece Cake had violated the Colorado statute. There was a long administrative proceeding. 
There was an investigator, and then a hearing examiner, and finally a decision by the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. It ruled against Masterpiece Cake Shop and Jack Phillips, ruled in favor of the gay couple. Masterpiece Cake Shop, Jack Phillips, appealed, as it was allowed to do, to the Colorado Court of Appeals. The Colorado Court of Appeals ruled against Masterpiece Cake Shop, saying it violated the Colorado law. The Colorado Supreme Court denied review in the case. The United States Supreme Court granted review. There were two questions presented to the Supreme Court that were profound significance. One is, can a business owner discriminate against same-sex couples on account of the business owner's religious beliefs? The other issue is, would it violate freedom of speech to force Masterpiece Cake Shop to design and bake a cake when it doesn't want to do so? The Supreme Court answered neither of those questions. Instead, in a seven to two decision, the court ruled in favor of Masterpiece Cake Shop, but on much narrower grounds. Justice Kennedy wrote for the court, only Justices Ginsburg and Sotomayor dissented. Justice Kennedy said, it violates free exercise of religion for government officials to express hostility to religion. Justice Kennedy said here, the members of the Colorado Civil Rights Commission expressed such hostility, such animus to religion, thus they violated free exercise of religion. I do think in understanding and appraising this case, it's important to focus on what was the evidence of hostility to religion that was before the Colorado Civil Rights Commission? What was the animus against religion that caused the court to rule in favor of Masterpiece Cake Shop? Justice Kennedy pointed to three things. He said, first, at an initial hearing of the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, one of the commissioners said, anyone who wants to do business in Colorado has to serve all customers regardless of the business owner's religious beliefs. Hard to see that as hostility to religion. That was just stating the requirements of Colorado law. The second piece of evidence that Justice Kennedy pointed to was that at a second meeting of the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, one of the commissioners said, many terrible things have been justified in world history in the name of religion. Slavery and the Holocaust were justified in the name of religion. This commissioner said, it's despicable for a person to harm another on account of his or her religious beliefs. It's sad, but it's true that many terrible things have been justified in world history in the name of religion. Hard to see that as expressing hostility to religion. And finally, Justice Kennedy said that there were some other cases where bakers were not held liable then they refused to bake cakes with particular messages. But as Justice Kagan pointed out in a concurring opinion, as Justice Ginsburg pointed out in a dissenting opinion, in none of those instances did the bakers refuse to bake cakes on account of race, sex, religion, or sexual orientation, the kind of discrimination prohibited by the Colorado law. Justice Thomas wrote a concurring opinion joined by Justice Gorsuch. He said that he would vote in favor of Masterpiece Cake Shop based on freedom of speech, that it would be impermissible infringement of free exercise of speech, freedom of expression, to force Masterpiece Cake Shop to design and bake a cake when the owner didn't want to do so. If ever a majority of the court accepts this argument, it will have breathtaking implications with regard to civil rights law. Start by thinking about it in the context of weddings. If baking a cake is speech, then isn't designing floral arrangements for a wedding speech? There was another case before the Supreme Court that it didn't take last year then called Arlene's Flowers versus Washington State that involved a florist in Washington who refused to make floral arrangements for same-sex weddings. If baking a cake, designing floral arrangements to speak, what about taking pictures? There was a case in New Mexico that involved a photographer who refused to take pictures at a same-sex wedding, saying it would be impermissible compelled speech. There was a case from an Arizona Court of Appeals at the end of June that involved a stationery store that refused to engrave wedding invitations for same-sex weddings. In fact, if baking a cake is speech, then isn't cooking food speech? A very famous Supreme Court case in the mid-1960s involved a restaurant in Birmingham, Alabama called Ollie's Barbecue. 
Ollie's Barbecue refused to admit or serve African American customers. It argued in the Supreme Court that it should have the constitutional right to choose its customers. It lost unanimously. But if there's a First Amendment free speech right to not serve customers, why wouldn't Ali's Barbecue then win? At the oral arguments before the Supreme Court in Masterpiece Cake Shop, Justice Breyer said if the Supreme Court were to accept this free speech claim, it would create an exception to every civil rights law adopted, quote, since day two. I don't know why Justice Breyer picked day two for his comment, but I do think it's a profoundly important point. There's always a tension between liberty and equality. Any law that prohibits discrimination limits the freedom to discriminate. For more than a half century, the Supreme Court has been clear that stopping discrimination is more important than the freedom to discriminate. That's really the underlying issue with regard to Masterpiece Cake, and it hasn't been resolved. There's another case where the Supreme Court's asked to review this term that involves a baker in Oregon that refused to bake cake for a same-sex wedding. As I said, there's a case coming out of Washington that'll soon be back before the Supreme Court that involves a florist that refused to make floral arrangements for same-sex weddings. So the Supreme Court's getting many opportunities for resolving the issue. The question is, without Anthony Kennedy on the Supreme Court, Will there be five votes to uphold anti-discrimination laws? I guess the bottom line as you think about Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission is that the Supreme Court left unresolved the key question, was the Colorado Court of Appeals correct in concluding that bakers can't be choosers? <laughs> the second case that I listed is the speech comes out of California. It's National Institute of Family and Life Advocates versus Becerra. A few years ago, the California legislature adopted a law, Governor Jerry Brown signed it, that said that any facilities in the state that provide reproductive health care service to women must post a notice that the state of California will make available free and low-cost contraception abortions for women who economically qualify. Also, the law says that facilities that are not licensed to provide health care in the state must post a no notice that they're not licensed to provide health care. The legislative history of this law says that the California legislature was very concerned that the, a large number, as many as 200, so-called pregnancy crisis counseling centers in the state, these are affiliated with religion. And these try very much to discourage women from having abortions. The legislature said that these facilities don't tell women of what the state will provide in terms of services. The legislative history said that these pregnancy crisis counseling centers often give women inaccurate information about the health consequences of abortion. A few of these pregnancy crisis counseling centers brought a challenge in federal court. Their argument was to force them to post the notices was impermissible compelled speech. The Supreme Court has said if the government forces people to engage in speech, that infringes the Constitution. The United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit upheld the California law. Judge Dorothy Nelson wrote for the court. Judge Nelson said, the government regulates speech by professionals in countless ways. Doctors, lawyers often have to give information to their patients and clients so they can make informed decisions. Judge Nelson said, no one is required by the California law to utter any words. It's just a notice has to be posted on a wall that the state would make available free and low-cost contraception abortion for women who economically qualify. A notice would have to be posted on the wall that a facility wasn't licensed, right, health care. Judge Nelson said, this serves a very important interest, making sure that women in the state are properly informed. On Tuesday, June 26th of this year, the Supreme Court, in a five to four decision, reversed the Ninth Circuit. The court was split ideologically. Justice Thomas wrote for the court. His opinion was joined by Chief Justice Roberts, as well as Justices Kennedy, Alito, and Gorsuch. Justice Breyer wrote the dissent, joined by Justice Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Justice Thomas said that the California law is what's called in First Amendment jurisprudence a 
content-based restriction on speech. He said the California law prescribes the required content of the disclosures. It's well established in First Amendment law that there's a strong presumption against content-based restrictions on speech. Such laws are allowed only if the government has a compelling reason for them and only if the law is necessary. There's no other way to achieve the government's objective. Justice Thomas said, there's other ways that California could achieve its goals of informing women. He said, California could take out public service announcements or put up billboards that the state will provide free and low-cost contraception abortions for women economically qualified. He said, there's no proof that women in the state don't know when a physician, when a facility is unlicensed to provide health care. Justice Breyer, as I said, wrote the dissent. He made two points. One is that the court is discriminating against speech that's meant to inform women of their rights with regard to abortion, while allowing regulations that are meant to discourage abortions. There was a Supreme Court case in 1992, Planned Parenthood versus Casey. In part, it involved a Pennsylvania law that required that doctors give detailed disclosures to women before they gave an abortion. For instance, one of the things that doctors had to tell women was that there was a list available of adoption providers. The doctor had to tell women that there were pictures available as to the fetus at that stage of development that they could view. The Supreme Court upheld that law, rejected a First Amendment challenge. Justice Breyer says, if you compare these two cases, what it means is if the state is requiring disclosures that are designed to discourage abortion, that doesn't violate the First Amendment. But if the state is requiring disclosures to inform women of their rights, including about abortion, that's unconstitutional. He said, in the Pennsylvania law, the doctors were actually required to utter words, to tell the patients this information. This is nothing but a notice posted on the wall. The second point that Justice Breyer made is that this will make all laws requiring disclosures constitutionally vulnerable. Any law that requires there be a disclosure by definition, is prescribing the required content of the speech. Think of laws that require that restaurants disclose calorie content to those who are purchasing the food, or laws that require that places where alcohol is served disclose that the consumption of alcohol can be harmful to pregnant women, or laws that require that it be disclosed where toxic substances are present, or the many federal and state laws that require that employers post notices informing employees of their rights. All of these, Justice Breyer says, are now constitutionally vulnerable. Justice Breyer says in all of these instances, it's possible to imagine some other way that the government can inform people about that which it wants people to have knowledge about. Now, Justice Thomas responded to this in his majority opinion. Justice Thomas said, all of Justice Breyer's examples, like the examples I just mentioned to you, are, quote, non-controversial factual information. But what's non-controversial and what's just factual is in the eyes of the beholder. So I think what we're going to see in court now all the time is challenges to laws requiring disclosure, a vast array of consumer and employment contexts. The third case that I listed will affect some of you directly. The case is Janus versus American Federation. In 1977, in Abood versus Detroit Board of Education, the Supreme Court reaffirmed that no one can be required to join a public employees union. But the court said that non-union members can be required to pay the share of the union dues that go to support the collective bargaining activities of the union. The court said non-union members benefit from collective bargaining in their wages, their hours, their working conditions. The Supreme Court said that non-union members shouldn't be able to be free riders. But the court said non-union members can't be required to pay the share of the union dues that go to support the political activities of the union. The court said that would be impermissible compelled speech. Twice in the last decade, the five conservative just on the court sharply criticized Abood. It seemed clear they were inviting a case before them that would give them the chance to overrule a boot. 
That case came to the Supreme Court a few years ago. It was Friedrichs versus California Teacher Association. It involved a public school teacher in Orange County, California, Rebecca Friedrichs, who said it violated her First Amendment rights to force her to pay the share of the union dues that go to support collective bargaining. But before the court could decide the case, Justice Scalia died. The court predictably announced it was split four to four. When the justice split four to four, it means that whatever the lower court decided stands, and here the lower court had followed Supreme Court precedent and said Rebecca Friedrichs had to pay the share of the union dues that go to support collective bargaining. I can only imagine how the lawyers on both sides felt when they learned of Justice Scalia's death on February 13th. For lawyers for the unions, there was an enormous sigh of relief. In California and in 21 other states, non-union members have to pay the share of the dues that go to support collective bargaining. Overruling a booth would be a serious blow to the revenues, to the membership of unions. For lawyers for the National Right to Work Committee, there was the sense that this was certain victory that they'd worked for for years being snatched away. Quite predictably, another case came to the Supreme Court, and that's Janus versus American Federation. Mark Janus is a public employee in Illinois. Illinois, like California, requires non-union members to pay the so-called agency fees, the part of the union dues that go to support collective bargaining. Janus objected and said to force him to pay the share of the union dues violated his First Amendment rights. On Wednesday, June 27th this year, in a 5-4 to four decision, the Supreme Court overruled Abood. Justice Alito wrote, joined by the conservative justices, Chief Justice Roberts, Justice Kennedy, Justice Thomas, Justice Gorsuch, Justice Alito wrote, uh, Justice Kagan wrote a scathing dissent, and Justice Kagan's dissent was joined by Justice Ginsburg, Breyer, and Sotomayor. Justice Alito said that compelling somebody to spend money is a form of compelled speech in violation of the First Amendment. He said the government can compel somebody to speak or to spend money only if it's necessary to achieve a compelling purpose. The court rejected that preventing free riders or preserving labor peace is a sufficiently compelling interest. Justice Kagan in her dissent said, this is striking down thousands of labor management contracts in 22 states affecting millions of government workers. She said there's no reason for overruling the Supreme Court decision in Abu. It's never been proven to be impractical or harmful in practice. She said the majority is doing so just because it didn't like the decision and because it wants to. She accused the majority of weaponizing the First Amendment. This case is already having major effects, including leading to a great deal of litigation. The week after Janus was decided by the Supreme Court, 10 lawsuits were filed in federal courts across the country by non-union members who had paid agency fees before June 27, 2018. They said being forced to do so would violate the First Amendment rights. They want a refund of all the money they ever paid with regard to these agency fees. If they win these lawsuits, it will bankrupt these public employee unions. That money has already been spent. Twice in his majority opinion, Justice Alito said that exclusive representation in bargaining is in tension with the First Amendment. The very core of the National Labor Relations Act is exclusive representation in bargaining by unions. Admittedly, that limits the ability of a person to bargain or represent himself or herself. But there's now cases pending arguing that this is unconstitutional. Or what about other mandatory fees? The Supreme Court, in a case based on a boot, had upheld mandatory bar dues. But now a number of lawsuits have been filed around the country arguing that it violates the First Amendment to require that lawyers pay bar dues. A number of cases have now been filed arguing that mandatory student fees violate the First Amendment. This is going to be litigated on the basis of the court's decision in Janus. So on so many levels, it's a case that's going to really make a huge difference. The third major area that I listed in the handout concerns immigration. And if you would ask me, what was the single most important decision during October term 2017, I would say Trump versus Hawaii. On Friday, January 27, 
2017, a week after taking office, Donald Trump issued an executive order that he's referred to as the travel ban. It suspended immigration from seven designated countries for a period of 90 days. It suspended the refugee program for 120 days. It applied even to those who had green cards and visas. It had an exception for those who are of minority religions in these overwhelmingly Muslim countries. Very quickly, federal courts around the country began to issue injunctions. A federal district court in Washington state issued a nationwide preliminary injunction. In other words, a nationwide order to keep the travel ban from going into effect. The United States Court of Appeals, the Federal Court of Appeals for the West Coast, unanimously upheld the preliminary injunction. The Federal Court of Appeals said that the travel ban was clearly motivated by animus hostility against Muslims. Rather than seek Supreme Court review, President Trump issued a new executive order, a new version of the travel ban, sometimes called Travel Ban 2.0. It suspended immigration from six designated countries for a period of 90 days. It's the same list as before, but Iraq was taken off the list. It suspended the refugee program for 120 days. It did not apply to those with green cards and visas, and it did not have an exception for those who are minority religions. A federal district court in Baltimore issued a preliminary injunction. The United States Court of Appeals, the Federal Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia, and it covers that part of the country, upheld the injunction. Judge Roger Gregory said that the travel ban was, quote, dripping with religious animus against Muslims. Meanwhile, a federal district court in Hawaii issued an injunction, and the Federal Court of Appeals on the West Coast, the Ninth Circuit, affirmed. On Monday, June 26, 2017, the Supreme Court granted review in both of these cases. The court said they'll be briefed over the summer of 2017. They'll be argued in October of 2017. But right before oral argument, the justices realized that the 90-day period had lapsed. The 120-day period is about to expire. The court took the cases off the oral argument calendar, and the court dismissed them as moot. President Trump then issued a third version of the travel ban, this time by executive proclamation. It suspended immigration from eight designated countries. Five were on the original list, and added to that list were North Korea, Venezuela, and Chad. Do you know how many people come to the United States each year from North Korea? I checked, 18. And I have no idea what Chad did to get itself on this list. <laughs> but it was taken off the list before the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in April. Maybe that's so the Solicitor General wouldn't have to try to answer that question. It also, the executive proclamation suspended the refugee program. Federal District Court in Hawaii again issued a preliminary injunction. The Federal Court of Appeals affirmed. Federal District Court in Baltimore issued a preliminary injunction. The Federal Court of Appeals in Richmond affirmed. On Tuesday, June 26, the Supreme Court in a five to four decision reversed the lower courts and upheld President Trump's travel ban. Chief Justice Roberts wrote for the court, joined by Justices Kennedy, Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch. There were two dissenting opinions. Justice Breyer wrote a relatively narrow dissent, joined by Justice Kagan. Justice Sotomayor wrote a vehement dissent, joined by Justice Ginsburg. Chief Justice Roberts said, under the Constitution, a president has great discretion with regard to controlling immigration. He said, a president's decision with regard to immigration will be upheld so long as it is rationally related to a legitimate government purpose. He said, we don't focus on the actual purpose of the government. We focus on only whether there's a conceivable legitimate purpose. So the actual purpose of President Trump in issuing the travel ban becomes irrelevant. The only question is, is there a conceivable legitimate purpose? And Chief Justice Roberts says, national security is a conceivable legitimate purpose here. Justice Breyer, as I said, wrote a Nero dissent. In it, he said, there's so many exceptions in the executive proclamation. Litigants now argue that this makes it arbitrary and irrational. Justice Sotomayor, as I said, wrote an angry dissent. She began by quoting at length from the statements Donald Trump is a presidential candidate. Donald Trump is president. 
top level presidential advisors who said that they wanted to have a Muslim ban. She said, this is discrimination against religion that violates the Constitution. She compared the evidence of religious discrimination in this case to that in Masterpiece Cake Shop. She said in Masterpiece Cake Shop, it was relatively mild evidence of religious animus. Here she said, it was manifest and overt. She likened the Supreme Court's decision in this case to its infamous ruling in Korematsu versus the United States in 1944, where the Supreme Court upheld the evacuation and internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. So in both instances, the government was making decisions based on group characteristics, ethnicity, national origin, not based on individual dangerousness. She said in neither instance was there any proof of need. During World War II, not one Japanese American was ever indicted or convicted of espionage or a crime against national security. With regard to the eight countries, with regard to President Trump's travel ban, not one terrorist act in the United States has ever been linked to anybody from these eight countries. And she said, this is just discrimination on the basis of religion, and it violates the Constitution. I think that this case is going to be important in the future because it gives the president such broad powers with regard to immigration. So long as the administration can articulate some conceivable legitimate purpose, that will be good enough, very hard to challenge presidential policies with regard to immigration. The fourth and final area that I listed from last year concerns voting rights. In the case that everyone thought was going to make such a big difference was Gill versus Whitford. It involves a practice that's referred to as partisan gerrymandering. Partisan gerrymandering is where the political party that controls the legislature draws election districts to maximize their seats for that party. It's where a Republican-controlled state legislature draws election districts to maximize their seats for Republicans. It's where a Democratic-controlled city council draws city council districts to maximize their seats for Democrats. Partisan gerrymandering is nothing new. It takes its name from a governor of Massachusetts early in American history, Elbridge Geary, who engaged in the practice. What's changed, though, is that partisan gerrymandering can be done through sophisticated computer programs with far more precision than ever before. I think there's likely to be a case this term of the Supreme Court coming from North Carolina. North Carolina is basically a purple state, leaning red. It went for Obama in 2008, Romney in 2012, Trump in 2016. Republicans got a slight majority of the votes for the state legislature and then drew election districts to give Republicans supermajority in both houses of the North Carolina legislature and control of 10 of 13 congressional districts from North Carolina. Gill versus Whitford comes from Wisconsin. It's similar facts to what I just described from North Carolina. Republicans got a slight majority of the votes cast for the Wisconsin state legislature, 52%. But they then drew state legislative districts to give Republicans a sizable majority of both houses of the Wisconsin legislature. A three-judge federal district court in November 2016 found that this violates equal protection, that it's unconstitutional vote dilution. The United States Supreme Court didn't reach the merits of the dispute. Instead, in an opinion by Chief Justice Roberts, the court said that the plaintiffs failed to prove that they had standing to sue. In order for someone to sue in federal court, the person has to have standing. In order to have standing, the person has to allege and prove that he or she was personally injured. Chief Justice Roberts said, the plaintiffs in their complaint allege that they lived in districts that have affected by partisan gerrymandering. But he said the plaintiffs didn't prove at trial that they lived in districts that were affected by partisan gerrymandering. So he says, go back and prove that. Justice Kagan wrote a concurring opinion. She talked about why partisan gerrymandering is a threat to the democratic process. She said, plaintiffs, when you go back to the lower court, just prove you live in a district that's been affected by partisan gerrymandering. So that'll be easy to do. And she said, don't present this as an equal protection claim about your vote dilution. Make it a First Amendment claim 
that you're being discriminated against because of your political party affiliation. Everyone thinks that Justice Kagan was trying to write a roadmap for the plaintiffs when they go back to the lower court, how when the case comes back to the Supreme Court to most appeal to Anthony Kennedy. But Justice Kennedy won't be there when the case comes back. And it's hard to imagine that there'll be five votes to declare partisan gerrymandering unconstitutional without Anthony Kennedy on the court. I think that partisan gerrymandering is an enormous threat to our democratic system. We all learned, maybe in a civics class, that it's supposed to be voters who choose their elected officials. Partisan gerrymandering is that it's the elected officials who are choosing their voters. Now in California and a handful of other states, there's now independent commissions to draw districts. But for the rest of the country, the Supreme Court's refusal to deal with the problem, I think is an enormous threat to our democratic system. So those were the most important things that the Supreme Court had before it last year. So far, the Supreme Court doesn't have any high profile potential blockbuster cases on the docket. There's no cases for this year involving abortion rights, or gun rights, or gay and lesbian rights. But the court will continue to grant review in cases between now and the middle of January to be decided this term by the end of June. And I think we'll get a clear sense from the cases that are on the docket, the ones that are still be taken, of what it's going to mean that Anthony Kennedy has been replaced by Brett Kavanaugh. That's why I began by saying it's an amazing, it's a pivotal time in the United States Supreme Court and it's going to ultimately affect all of us. So again, thank you for having me today and thank you for coming. Oh, I can do questions. I, there's time for, I was just told to finish at one, but if people have questions, I'm glad if you want to ask questions. I can also take them informally after. But um, please, I'd be delighted to take questions. And there's a microphone. Thank you. Hi. Thank you very much. Um, some people have hoped that if we get a Democratic president and retake the Senate, the Democrats retake the Senate, that they can increase the number of uh, Supreme Court justices. Sure. The number of justices on the Supreme Court is not set by the Constitution. It's set by federal statute. It's varied over the course of American history from five at the beginning to as many as 10 in the 1860s. Nine is a historical accident. In the late 1860s, Congress did not want to let President Andrew Johnson appoint anyone to the Supreme Court. Johnson was a senator from Tennessee who was nominated to be vice president in 1864 as a unity measure. When Abraham Lincoln got assassinated, Johnson, a southerner, found himself presiding over Reconstruction. And in fact, Congress went so far as to impeach him, though there weren't two thirds vote to remove him. So to keep Johnson from replacing a justice, Congress passed a law saying, as soon as there's another vacancy on the Supreme Court, that seat will be eliminated. And that's how we got to nine. And it's been nine since the late 1860s. Congress could change the number of justices just by statute. So if there's a Democratic president and a Democratic Congress after January 20th, 2021, they could increase the number of justices. My sense is that this is something the Democrats should consider, but it's premature to really talk about. Um, there is a strong sense among Democrats that there's a stolen seat on the Supreme Court, that Justice Scalia died on February 13, 2016. President Obama nominated Chief Judge Merrick Garland for the first time in history. The Senate had said no hearings, no vote. 24 times before 2016, there'd been a vacancy in the last year of our president's term. In 21 of 24, the Senate confirmed. In three, the Senate denied confirmation. But never before had the Senate said, we're not going to hold hearings or a vote. Merrick Garland's nomination languished longer than any nomination to the Supreme Court in history. And so it's understandable why the Democrats want to say, in light of that, in light of that, with regard to the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh, they should increase the size of the Supreme Court. On the other hand, there's no stopping that. If the Democrats increase to 11, and if the Republicans take the White House and Congress and say 2028, they can make it 13 or 15, and so on. My own sense is that the Democrats should think about it but not talk about it. There's no point in saying we're going to do this because that would just inspire more Republicans to come out and vote. The number one reason that Trump voters gave for casting their ballot in his favor was the Supreme Court. 
54% of Trump voters said that the most important consideration for them was the Supreme Court. So I've got a question here, and then I'll, right here. Okay. And then I'll pass the mic. Um, so some of the core tenets of our democracy are checks and balances and an independent judiciary. Okay. So, you know, with what you just said about what happened to the Merrick Garland nomination and then the way they forced through the Kavanaugh confirmation and the Heritage Foundation's secret plan of grooming law clerks and lower court judges to have an extreme conservative approach on the bench, there's no more independent judiciary. So what happens to our democracy then if people don't trust in that independence of the court? And even when there's lower court rulings that are effectively acting as a check on this administration, those rulings will end up in the Supreme Court. So what do you make of all that? I'm enormously concerned. I think that the effect of the Kavanaugh hearings and his confirmation is going to create a taint that will always be there as long as he's on the court. I think the way in which the, Gors the Garland nomination was blocked, the way in which the Senate confirmed Neil Gorsuch by changing longstanding Senate rules to eliminate the filibuster for Supreme Court nomination, Bush versus Gore, the confirmation of Clarence Thomas. I don't know what it's going to mean in the long term. I don't know if it's going to create a crisis with regard to confidence in the Supreme Court like there was in the 1930s. I don't know if it'll lead to a point at which government officials feel comfortable disobeying Supreme Court orders. I don't know if it'll lead to a change in the size of the Supreme Court, but it is something to be enormously concerned about. Um, our hope has to be that the Supreme Court, regardless of all of this, will enforce checks and balances that lower federal court judges will do so. And we also have to look increasingly, I think, to turning to state courts and state constitutions to protect our rights when the federal courts won't be there to do that. But I'm very concerned about it. And the, one last question. And then I can stay informally and answer questions. Um, <clears throat> given the, the ch recent change in the landscape and the way um, Kavanaugh's election was kind of forced through, do you see any possibility in someone else on the Supreme Court becoming more of a swing player in response to these other events? I think that in some areas, John Roberts will become more moderate and move the court more incrementally. Roberts cares a lot about the long-term legitimacy of the court and about his legacy. But I think there are certain areas where John Roberts isn't going to play that role. And those are areas like gay and lesbian rights, abortion rights, affirmative action. Let me take gay and lesbian rights as an example. I predicted publicly that the Supreme Court was going to declare laws prohibiting same-sex marriage unconstitutional by a six to three margin. And I said, John Roberts can be part of the majority. And my reasoning was that John Roberts wants to be on the right side of history. We all know where history is going with regard to gay and lesbian marriage. Not only was I wrong in did John Roberts' dissent but he wrote an angry, vehement dissent. The only dissent that John Roberts has ever read from the bench since coming on the Supreme Court in October 2005 was a dissent in Oberfell versus Hodges against marriage equality. Where John Roberts has been most outspoken is believing that all forms of affirmative action are unconstitutional, that the Constitution requires that the government always be race blind. He said this very much so in his opinion in Parents Involved Community Schools versus Seattle School District number one. And I believe that John Roberts is similarly strongly against abortion rights. Since coming onto the Supreme Court 13 years ago, John Roberts has never voted to strike down any federal, state, or local restriction on abortion. So I think in the areas where Roberts is a conservative true believer, these areas where it's long been the conservative ideology to come out a certain way, I don't see Roberts being a moderating influence. And I have no illusion that is to the other justices, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and Kavanaugh, that they're going to turn out to be a swing justice. We've entered an era without a swing justice. We've entered an era where we have the most conservative Supreme Court since the mid-1930s, and it's likely to remain that way for many years to come. Thank you again. I, I just want to officially thank Dean Chemerinsky. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and your knowledge about the Supreme Court, both the liberal and the conservative insights um, on the issues of, of our day. Um, we really appreciate it.
I want to remind you that there is Staff Appreciation Week going on, not just this week, but every week we appreciate you. Um, one thing that's special about this week, though, is there is a scavenger hunt. So if you haven't already signed up for that, it's an opportunity to go hang out on campus and learn a few things about campus. So please do that. Please also, especially in light of our talk today, engage in the democratic process next week. Go vote. Thank you all. Thanks, Dean.